All right, this is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 13, Antebellum Idealism and Reform Impulses, 1820 to 1860. We'll be looking at Section 1, An Awakening of Religion and Individualism. So in a previous chapter, we talked about some major, so first of all, uh, let's go ahead and review this term right here, antebellum. Ante, antebellum means before the Civil War, right, before the Civil War. And in a previous chapter, we had talked about some major economic uh, changes taking place prior to the Civil War. This was mostly related to industrialism. Remember the rise of things like, you know, the factory system, factory work, the rise of things like railroads. Um, in other words, there was a lot of changes going on on the economic level, social level, and then cultural level. And so a lot of these changes here, right, will have their impact on society. So society is kind of everyday people, how they live, how they work, et cetera, et cetera. And because society has changed, then they have an impact on culture, and that is people's belief systems, uh, sometimes positive, sometimes negative. Uh, so that's the context for which these changes are taking place, right? There is a much larger change going on on an economic level. There's a much larger change going on on a societal level, urbanization, stuff like that. Uh, and that affects things like culture, right? Belief systems. This is mostly happening in the North. Right. This is most intensely felt in the north, although to a certain degree, you do find some of these uh, changes also taking place in the south. So um, one of the things that really underlines a lot of the cultural change, that is the change in things like belief systems, uh, is the second great awakening. Uh, this is a term that we've actually already come across this semester. Uh, a great awakening refers to any type of uh, increase. in what we might call religiosity, you know, things like church attendance, preacher, uh, preachers, or uh, preacher activity, uh, any sort of increase in the amount of religiosity, whether that's religious participation, literature, whatever else it is. The First Great Awakening happened prior to the American Revolution. This one is occurring uh, really in the years leading up to the Civil War. Now, some of the things that the First and Second Great Awakening have in common is that they both stressed emotion, right? Emotion over logic and reason. Uh, you know, a good kind of way to think about the Great Awakening is that Great Awakening preachers stated that it was, you know, a religion is a matter of the heart, not the mind. That instead you ought to feel religion. It should be more emotional rather than logical and thinking about it. Uh, this is an image of one of the revivals that was held during the Second Great Awakening. Or, uh, yeah, I guess a picture, not a photograph, a painting, an illustration. That's what I'm looking for. Uh, and, uh, you know, the types of sermons that were held that preached, you know, various denominations of Christianity were very emotional. You can see people in the crowd are, you know, like fainting and, you know, they're having a very sort of uh, bonding experience. Now, one thing that made the Second Great Awakening unique was this point about personal salvation. We might also call this individual salvation. And, you know, this had a lot to do with the ability for one to be able to kind of make things right after they had sinned. So this is the maybe the personal power to absolve sins. This is a very strict uh, rejection, right, of predestination. So one very powerful message that came with the Second Great Awakening was that people have the power to do right, that even though if you've sinned in the past, you have the power to change your life and achieve salvation. This was, again, rejecting this notion of predestination. This idea of individuality, you also might want to tie this to kind of a larger political uh, change going on, and that is Jacksonian democracy. Right, recall that politically speaking at this time, you have more political participation opening up. This is like the cultural or spiritual version of it. Uh, some popular offshoots of this Second Great Awakening included millennialism. This was the belief 
that God would establish a kingdom on earth, right? This is the return of God on earth, and that this would go on for a thousand years. Uh, another uh, a characteristic of the Second Great Awakening is that it brought in a much larger swath of people. Uh, generally speaking, we could say that it was more diverse in the number of people. This included men and women who participated in it. Uh, this included whites, blacks, Native Americans. Right, so much larger swath or much more diverse swath of the population was part of this religious revival and one of the impacts that this had was that it it you know it encouraged in some ways for slave masters to uh, bring christianity to their slaves but there is an important distinction that we need to make and that is although by the time of the civil war most african americans and most slaves in fact are practicing or are christians that there is a difference between master theology and slave theology or master Christianity and slave Christianity, that there was, you know, different emphasis within each one. Uh, and one of the consequences, or at least one of the examples to show this much more diverse range is the establishment of the Methodist Episcopal Church led by Richard Allen. This was an all black Protestant church, right? And here, of course, you have a picture of the preacher, Richard Allen. So you had separate uh, black communities that were embracing the Christian church, and uh, the Second Great Awakening had a, a part in spreading that message to a much more diverse population. By far the most um, popular preacher of the Second Great Awakening was Charles Finney, who you see here. And whenever these religious revivals, right, when this revival would come to town and tens of thousands of people would turn out and suddenly people were not just attending church more, but made religion a much more central part of their life, uh, those territories were called burned over districts. So this was an area swept up by religious revival. And the important part about the Second Great Awakening here is that this sort of stronger emphasis on Christianity, which is sweeping throughout essentially the entire nation, both north and south, a lot of these ideas are going to have their impact on uh, the idealism and the reforms that people push through. So in both of these cases, Protestant Christianity plays kind of a big and central role there. So as we start to talk about some of the more particular impulses, the mo more particular belief systems, like something like millennialism, which again was a much uh, sort of smaller belief system, um, you know, what's kind of going on in the background is that in general, you just have a, a more of an upsurge or an uptick in um, the way that Christianity is being practiced. Now, there were other philosophical movements that were not religious. Uh, transcendentalism, which much more of an intellectual movement. Intellectual, but also spiritual, right? It wasn't necessarily tied directly to Christianity, although it had its various influences. And really what transcendentalism was all about was, again, and this is a theme that you'll see, uh, individualism. and reject conformity, right? And there's a lot of ways that they could do that. That was especially true of something like American society. Two of the most well-known transcendentalists include Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. Uh, Emerson wrote, uh, we got two examples here. One is nature, and that is kind of a rejection of urban and industrial society, right? That the concrete jungle of society, the steam engine, uh, the railroads, you know, everything that made the cities really a cesspool for disease and crime and overcrowding and a lot of the problems, you know, Emerson and the Transcendentalists really stressed the idea of nature and nature being important, that you have to go out and live in nature in order to find oneself. In fact, Henry David Thoreau, the other Transcendentalist, wrote Walden, and this was his experience, 
living in nature. You know, he had spent, I forgot exactly how long he had spent, but he had lived, I don't know, maybe two years or something um, out on a pond in nature to kind of get rid of or, or distance himself from the corrupt American society. Uh, on self-reliance, again, is a work oops, on individualism, right? Especially in something like a market economy, right? A market economy is an economy where you buy and sell things. One of the consequences of the, you know, the, the increase dependency on the market economy is that you lose your individuality. Uh, you get swept up by American culture. You're sought to conform, right? Reject conformity is a big part of this. Uh, Henry David Thoreau, again, another very important transcendentalist writer and thinker, in addition to writing Walden, which was his experience kind of reconnecting with nature after it was believed much of human society had lost that. He also wrote Civil Disobedience. This is, you know, what does a person do in an immoral and corrupt society? Right? You know, what do you do in an immoral and corrupt society? What do you do uh, it, you know, with an immoral and corrupt government? And rather than participate, what Henry David Thoreau says is that you've got to, um, you know, protest any immoral or unjust law. This serves the basis or will serve the basis for the resistance movements of people like Mohandas Gandhi in India who reject the British control. This is going to be a major influence on Martin Luther King Jr. later on in resisting segregation in the South. Uh, and so it really sort of, uh, you know, speaks to individual action that, okay, you're only one person. What do you do in a society that is immoral, corrupt, and has millions of people and a democratic system in which your vote seemingly doesn't count? Well, he says, you know, you have the moral obligation to uh, break unjust or immoral laws. And that is kind of the basis for his, um, his protest. You know, his, of course, what he protested was the Mexican-American War, which he believed to be... Um, an immoral war, and when that war broke out, Thoreau refused to pay his taxes. That, that's what his protest was. He was thrown in prison. You also have some other individuals that are worth mentioning. Uh, Margaret Fuller, she was also a transcendentalist thinker. She was a woman. She advocated for gender equality. And Walt Whitman, who was a poet, and in his poems, you really see things of individualism, and nature both play a central role there. And uh, of course, that's related to this larger movement of transcendentalism.